welcome. We, we ain't afraid of no ghosts. This is your number one podcast for ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties. Bringing you everything you need to know about things that go bump in the night and interviewing the personalities behind them. Make sure your doors and windows are locked. Now, here are your hosts, your ghost hosts, Scott and Julie. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Paranormal Project. Hi, Julie. How are you? I'm good, Scott. How are you? I'm good. You know, we took a break last week. We had that incredible snowstorm where some parts of Massachusetts got over two feet of snow. And uh, and we got not that I don't think you got anything where you are really right. We no, got about six inches. I'm on the coast. Yeah, I'm on the coast. I I am probably like ten minutes from Salem, uh, Massachusetts, uh, in lovely Peabody, and got hardly anything at all. Just kind of snish, as we call it here, snow and rain and no accumulation. Yeah, yeah and now it's gone. I mean, we got about six inches. It's completely gone. It's been sixty degrees plus the last day or two. So it's been really great. So we're glad to be back. Honestly, we just didn't want to be out traveling last week in the middle of the storm because it was kind of nasty when it was coming down. The roads just get nasty. Good. We nasty. did get nasty. Yeah. So, you know, this week um, we're bringing back someone that was on our show a few weeks ago. Now, Robert Neil Marshall is an actor. He is more than an actor. He's a playwright and, and director and, and he's done shows on and off Broadway and over in London's West End. And he's been on House of Cards and, and numerous other things here in the States. But he was on our show a couple of weeks ago because he actually played John Zaffis in several episodes of The Haunting. And he told me when we were preparing for this show that he'd never met John Zaffis. And so I thought it'd be really fun if he could come on and meet John and the two of them could meet each other for the first time because they never did actually meet each other while they were filming the show. So that was sort of a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. But Robert has his own story. <clears throat> Robert, Robert suffered a near-death experience <clears throat> and was revived in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And he has a fascinating story to tell. And Julie, I know this is near and dear to your heart because you've had one yourself. Yes. But exactly. he has created this documentary, which I've seen. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it yet, Julie, but it's called Back from the Light. And uh, it is about the near-death experience, but not so much about the near-death experience. It's yes, more it's about- Yes, it's very different. It's, it it doesn't document people's experiences during their experience. It documents the aftermath, which is absolutely fascinating. Right, which is what makes this so different. And you know, it's things that I never thought about. How does one come back into this world and integrate into this world after having an experience like that? So we're going to be talking with Robert tonight. And so we're going to bring him out. Chanel is Robert. There he is. There he is. I knew you were back there somewhere. Hi, here. Robert. Hi, Robert. Hi, Julie. Hey, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on the show. This is really exciting. This is I'm, I'm very emotional about it because every time we talk about this subject, as you can imagine, it's it's uh, it's very heartfelt, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you and I met, I don't know, probably been all of six months or more ago now. And and I've had a chance to talk about this a little yeah. bit. And even still, every time we talk about it, I learned something new. Hmm. And you and I have never spoken until today mm -hmm. about the actual near-death experience. I didn't know yeah. what, what happened to you on that day. Do you want to share a little bit about what happened that brought that on? Yeah, sure. Um, well, in hindsight, there's things that we figure out that we understand, you know, but that we didn't know at the time. And I had had serious gallbladder issues um, that were really bad. And I would have these gallbladder attacks that I didn't know what they were. And um, uh, I was actually working on a, a Cunard ship. I do a lot of, I used to do a lot of lectures, uh, guest speaking for the Cunard line on the Queen Mary 2. And I, one morning coming into Halifax, I had one of these terrible attacks after eating some, some really rich cookies and I didn't put two and two together. And I was sitting in the jacuzzi to, cause in literally wearing my sweatpants and the t-shirt because it was the only place I felt good, like to relieve the pain. And the doctor happened to walk by and it's like, what are you doing here at like seven in the morning? It dressed up in the jacuzzi. And, and we started to talk and he, he defined something as these colon spasms is all I knew what they were. And uh, no one had really thought to diagnose it. 
So I would have these attacks and they would last a few hours. Usually it would just lift, but it was in pretty heavy duty pain and it would be in my stomach. Sometimes it would generate up towards my chest, that kind of a thing. But I, I just got used to them. So we went out to dinner with friends at their house and, um, on the way out, they have this giant bowl, which is like the Halloween candy. It's always in the bowl, like the, you know, the caramel and the chocolate. And I snuck a few of them into my pocket and I ate them in the car on the way home. And I knew that sometimes I'd eat rich things that might have an effect on me. Didn't think about it. Went to bed that night. Woke up at like 2.30, 2.45 in the morning. Um, really not feeling well at all. And one of these attacks was coming on. And I thought, oh, darn, I shouldn't have eaten the chocolate. This is what it's, I get for doing all that. So, but something felt kind of different this time. It was more in my chest and I would get in the shower, let the hot water run on me and, you know, try to relax. And usually I would feel a little bit better, but I knew it was going to be several hours and then we just lift. I'd be fine. So I um, went in the shower and I'm trying to belch up like what was I thought would be indigestion. My throat's clear. There was nothing in my throat mm -hmm. and the pain wasn't going away and it was starting to spread into my arms. And I'm thinking something's not right here. And I went to my other half, um, Craig, who was sleeping at the time. I said, Craig, Craig, I, I think I need to call 911. I'm just not feeling something's wrong. <sighs> That's okay. I'll call 911 myself. You just sleep. <laughs> and um, so I called 911 and I presented myself as having, and this is like 45 minutes. I'm walking around the house like this now in between the shower and all of that. Oh, sorry. I left out a very important point before that. So I get out of the shower and I, I Google on my phone, my iPhone, heart attack symptoms, literally. Wow. And on it, it says, if any one of these elements, you know, are, are you've, you've experienced call 911 within five minutes. I'm 45, 50 minutes, as I said, walking around and I'm reading through check, 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 all of which are the exact same symptoms as these colon spasms. And I thought if I, but the last one was nausea and I never felt nausea. I had all the others, but not, and I thought if I didn't know any better, I think I'm having a heart attack. And that's when I went in, tried to wake up Craig. So I think I better call 911 because it was just so surreal. And um, they, they, I went downstairs and put on my bathrobe, put, went downstairs. And, you know, we talk a lot about spiritual connection. Obviously, that's why we're here. And there's often an inner voice in my head that I try to listen to that, that tells you to do something or not. I sat down on the sofa in the living room and a voice said, hit 911, hit the button now. So I did. And uh, they answered the phone and I was almost scared to say, I'm not feeling too well. I think it's just bad indigestion, but I don't know. And they said, would you want us to stay on the phone with you? I said, yes. And then um, they said they're on the way. And by this point, I think Craig had heard this and he got up and, and, and they said, if you have a dog, put the dog away. And I said, OK. So Craig was come, starting to get dressed and, and they came to the door and he's like, um, I'll get the dog later. I said, no, you got to put the dog away now. So he ran back upstairs. I answered the door and they're like, is it you who's I'm like, yeah, it's me. I just, it's indigested. I don't know. They said, can you walk to the ambulance? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And in my bathroom, I'm walking at three 30 in the morning. Now I'm walking to the ambulance outside thinking, Oh my God, I wonder if the neighbors are seeing this, you know, and I get it. I'd never been in an ambulance that I remember before that. And it was kind of like a spaceship inside, like blue lights, you know, low sort of blue white lights and things. And I sit in the chair and they they sort of said to me, what, what other symptoms do you have? And I was describing, I started to say my arms. I was feeling in my armpits. That set off alarms, apparently, um, with the paramedics. So one of them, this guy named Smiley, I learned later, this big handlebar mustache, he said, put a 12 lead on him. So instead of the normal EKG things, they wanted extra leads on me. And, and they said, can we open your bathrobe to get to your chest? And I'm in this chair, you know, in the ambulance and some guys behind me writing stuff. And this other guy's next to me and this guy Smiley's right there. And I said, yeah, sure. Whatever you need to do. Okay. Next thing I know, <laughs> it's like literally like changing the channel. As I said to Scott earlier on, on a remote control, I'm no longer in the ambulance. I am like floating in space, shooting through the stars, if you will. And I had no concept whatsoever that I had been sick, 
that I'd been in pain, that I just walked through, you know, my parking lot in the middle of the night. Uh, none of it. I'm just suddenly in a new place, new experience, the whole thing just floating along with it. And, you know, the elements, some of which were not as as current to me right immediately, but a lot of it, you know, afterwards became really crystal clear and has been indelible in my mind. And basically what happened is I found myself sort of in a corridor or this space just floating. And when I say there was a light at the end of the tunnel, which is a very corny phrase, it wasn't exactly like a light, but there was a brightness. There was illumination that was sort of like warm and beckoning. And I started to float towards it and upwards. And I found myself in, and, and other people have defined these things, which I found fascinating to hear other people describe it and what their emotion was because I could relate so personally in like this purple void that was, it, it was warm, it was friendly, it was encompassing. And I felt safe and I felt, you know, fine. And now as I started to move farther up into this purple void, I'm seeing these, these light entities sort of drifting towards me and I'm drifting up towards them. And the only way I could describe it is there's an artist named Kevin Gross and you can look him up online. He does fractals, okay? And fractals are part of nature. There's fractals in repeating patterns of grass blades and the wake behind a boat and all sorts of things. And so I'm looking at these entities that were amazing colors. I mean, neon greens and oranges and reds and purples and blues, but it, it, I can't describe it in any light. And even Kevin Gross's fractal drawings are, are pale in comparison to what it looked like. And this one entity is in front and there were others behind. And as I was approaching, all of this just felt so familiar. This is like, I know this, I love this. I felt safe. I felt home. But at the same time, I'm emotional and I'm mesmerized by the beauty of it. This entity in the front, which almost looked like light that was smoke, like almost like a filament of smoke, it, just beautiful. It started to come closer to me as I came closer to it. And as the smoke started to come, a tendril was coming out. I wish I, I should have thought, Scott, I would have previewed this video of, that Scott did of, of, of these fractals. But as one tendril started to touch me and meld with me, I instantly knew that this was my maternal grandmother. And we were very close. Uh, her birthday was the day before mine, and she had died um, oh, several years, 1987. And I just knew it was her. And as this entity was pouring into me, I was overwhelmed with this feeling of love that was just filling me. And I, I flashed back to a real moment that happened many years earlier when I was visiting her grave, which is in a cemetery, Mount Hebron, which is near LaGuardia Airport in New York. I was on a business trip. And there are these little low headstones for our family that have a little side sort of slant to them. And I just was missing her. And I sat down at this grave site by myself and I was leaning against the gravestone, missing her. And as I sat there and was rocking, I could feel her presence come into me exactly like I was feeling now. And, and it was filling me with this love. And I started sobbing. This is a real life episode for that. And I said, I can feel you. I can feel you. And now I'm here with her, this entity that I felt was her. And I, I was overwhelmed with the same emotion. And I said, and there were no words, but I said, this, this is the same feeling. This is exactly the same feeling I had that time I visited you. And this entity said to me, her, the reason I showed you that then is so that you would recognize this feeling now and know that this is real. Mm. And I'm like, ha ha, blah, you know. And there were these other entities that I will say, I, I have a feeling I know who they were or certain friends that I've lost, but I did not have an interaction that I remember. And I, I've heard other people say that sometimes recall, there will be emotions, memories that will come back later when you're ready for it. But then the scene kind of switched very quickly. And all of a sudden I am, <laughs> I'm in a plastic blue boat that we had at our house in New Jersey, where we used to live. We were lucky to have a swimming pool and there was this blue plastic boat that you could go in the swimming pool on. In the winter time, you would, we would use it as a sled. 
And all of a sudden I'm in this plastic boat and my younger brother is seated in front of me. We're wearing down jackets. I could feel the cold, the snow on my face. I, it was so real. And I had this knit cap down on my head and we're coming down the hill, this exhilaration of going down the hill. And <laughs> at the bottom of the hill was a chain link fence. And we were going to plow right into the chain link fence. And I remember thinking, oh, good. My brother's in front of me. He'll hit the fence before me and he will cushion. My... <laughs> right. And then and it's so real. And that really happened that moment. But all of a sudden I'm feeling this terrible remorse that I put my brother's my well-being ahead of my brother's. And it's like I've got to apologize to him. I've got to apologize for doing this to him. It was so amazingly real, but it sort of snapped me into something. Then, oh, there's Karen Tatro. Love you too, Karen. I'm sorry. I hope it's okay. Hey, Karen, I can interject. But at that moment, the scene suddenly switched. And I am now at a younger age in our den in New York City. We had an apartment at the time that overlooked Central Park West. And um, I had a very difficult upbringing. I had a very difficult childhood, particularly with um, a very aggressive stepfather um, who's no longer with us, uh, at least not in the physical form, I should say, and um, was a challenge, I mean, for me. And there was a time I, I literally wanted to to take my life. I, I couldn't cope with this anymore as a kid. I was seven or eight, somewhere in there. And I went into the den and I was going to jump out of the window and we were on the seventh floor. And I remember the wallpaper, this woven weave of this sort of fabric wallpaper that was in the den, this particular table that was at one end. There was a bar that was on a table that was under a built-in bookshelf. I could see, you know, all the dirty bottles, you know, that were half filled there. And there was an old um, ice bucket that had a bent, a bent tong hanging on it. The detail was incredible. And the the windows there was this radiator that came up about halfway and there was like a square grating in the radiator on the top and i could see all this detail it was nighttime and i climbed up onto the radiator and the, you you pull a handle and then you could push the window out and it had a little attachment on the bottom and i was i wanted to climb out and jump and i remember looking down and again like i'm i said i'm seven or eight somewhere in there and i said i'm gonna get in a lot of trouble if i do this you know, not like you'll die and you'll kill yourself. It's like, you, you know, someone will punish yeah. you. You'll get in trouble if you actually do this, which I thought was probably a reasonable thought for a child. And, and it, for a seven year old. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And at that moment, there is this voice that I don't know whether this voice was there then. And I was remembering it or it was a voice in my in the moment that I was being shown. And this voice said, if you're not on this planet, there are people who will not be born. There are people who will not have careers because not that I'm that special. All of us have a ripple effect, as we know, on everyone and everything. Every single one of us are special in that light. And in my work, I've, I've actually literally had actors that I have cast opposite each other in shows that then met, worked with each other, fell in love, and then had kids. And so these children, in effect because of the the catalyst are on this planet because of that and people who have careers because you say something nice you give someone an opportunity as they do to you then careers are made and people believe it, or they, they 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 go places from there and i was shown that my work isn't done and that people are counting on me spiritually if you will and so i had to come back then certainly not to take my life but the the broader message at this time was you you need to be here for that. And it, it was profound and emotional. And then the next thing I know, I'm like in this golden light. And I, I had this overwhelming sensation of being on nitrous oxide at the dentist. I don't know if anybody's ever had laughing gas, um, but it felt like someone gave me an entire bottle of it. I mean, intense, like, and I recognized the feeling immediately. And I don't know whether it was my body coming back with oxygen again or whether this was part of the process or the dying. I don't know. But I said to myself, again, I'm just riding this wave like this is just my new reality. I wasn't questioning it. It's just this is what it was. Yeah. And I said, why do I feel like I'm at the dentist? 
And this voice from somewhere said, well, we had to shock you. And I'm like, shock me. I mean, why would you shock me? And, and who's saying that? And, you know, and then the voice says, just relax. We're going to get you to the hospital. And I'm like, hospital. And I'm like, wait a second. Yeah, I wasn't feeling too good. Shock me. Oh, my God. There's only one reason they shock you. You know, I'm thinking if your heart stops or something goes wrong. And uh, I thought, wow, eh, whatever. You know, I mean, it was like that. Yeah. And then I was kind of in and out of consciousness and the ambulance was getting me to the hospital and I was in the, you know, like emergency, you know, like a cath lab. And it, I, I joke, I call it my alien abduction experience because that's what it felt like. There, there are lights shining and people talking. And then Craig was standing right over me at one point and my eyes were open. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't have anything gauze or anything, but I felt like there was a white gauze over my eyes and I, could, I said to him, I said, I can hear you, but I can't see you. And the doctor said, you really need to go. We need, I'm sorry, we need to get, get to work here. And Craig says he heard the doctor say, this is really bad as he left the room. I didn't know what the hell they were doing. And then they're like asking me questions like, well, how much do you weigh? And I'm like, wait, wait, I know this. I know this. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I could not think of things like that. And then something's brushing on my face. And then I'm feeling like a burning in my groin. And they say, well, I'm sorry, we have to do this. And I'm bracing for some more pain. And they'll say, oh, that wasn't so bad. And I have no idea what's going on, except this in and out. And, and at one point I'm looking across and I, 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 for a moment I could see what looked like I was in a janitor's closet, like with old books and things on a bookshelf. And I'm like, Bob, just go with this, you know, whatever this is. <laughs> and um, so, after a, a, a little while, I suddenly started to feel more present and I realized where I was and, and they were kind of finishing up and they, they basically told me that I had had a heart attack and that um, they had put an, a, a stent in me. The, what they were doing is going in my groin with a, a, a device and put a stent. Mm. I had a hundred percent blockage in my LAD, uh, the lower portion of my heart uh, from a plaque rupture. Something broke off like a banana and a straw and a milkshake. 100% blockage. I went into VFib. I had the widow, literally the widow maker, and they call it the widow maker because there's no way they can stop it. When your heart goes into VFib, it's not pumping anymore. It's quivering like jello. Mm. And once it goes into that pattern, there's nothing you could do. You are clinically dead at that moment. There's nothing pumping. You're not breathing. There's no oxygen going to your brain through your blood. And somebody once said, well, Bob, I could hold my breath for two minutes and, and I can still think and I could still like, that's not, I said, I thought about that. I said, oh yeah. And then I thought, wait a second. No, you're getting oxygen to your brain because your heart is still pumping blood into your brain. Now there's no more blood pumping to your brain. And apparently the only way they can break the rhythm of ventricular fibrillation is by shocking you. And I thought, oh, so like in the movies, they shock you and you come back and they go, oh, no, 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 no. They said that you flatlined. When they shock you, you are flatlined. It breaks the rhythm and your heart is stopped. Then they're just pounding the shit out of you. Can I say that on television here? Yeah. yeah. We're, 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 we're you want. <laughs> <laughs> We've had people say worse. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, but, and, and, so then, then they just they said they, they were just pounding on you. They're doing CPR, yeah. and they said, and by miracle, we just got your heartbeat back. Just, you know? a, just a question though. When you were out, and and it really seems like it was like walking from this room to that room. You, there was mm -hmm. like no seamlessness. There was seamless. You know, there was seamless. It, it was like I said, like changing the channel on a remote. Channel. It's like watching TV, <laughs> and I'm done with that. Let me click the channel. Yeah. I'm now watching something else. It was one minute you're here, one minute you're next minute. Else. It oh, was that so easy. Nice. But yeah, was that you your have a recollection you of your life here when you were there? Could you remember, Craig, could you remember your career when you were there? Or was it completely kept from you? Do you it was know? what I told you. It was that was the moment. I saw two moments. I saw my grandmother yeah. remembering that moment, particularly as like a, a validation is, is what I felt like. I mean, you know, and then I'm, I saw the moment with my brother. And I knew it was my brother. I mean, I was very clear about that, but I was reliving it. It was real. Yeah. I could feel it. I could feel the cold on my face. And then being in the den, and then I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm on my way back. Yeah, you're, you're just in this space, and you don't question it. Didn't, and didn't think about it. Did not question it. I went in for surgery, and mm -hmm. I coded. And wow. next thing I know, you know, um, 
when I come back, I'm intubated and everything else, and I have no mm-hmm. idea what's taking place. But right. I, mine was the next. What I remember, and there's a lot that I'm not, and I truly believe I'm not allowed to remember it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot that I'm not allowed to remember, but bits sure. and pieces do come back to me. Um, yes. As I was with someone that I felt very comfortable with. Don't remember who it was. Just know I was safe. I felt extremely loved and cared for. But the first thing that was relayed to me, and I don't know if we were speaking or communicating through clairvoyance, was I was told I wasn't staying, that I had things to do, and I was going back, and we were walking. My first realization was I was under a tree on this grassy knoll. <clears throat> in the air smelled like the first day of spring. It oh. was the sweetest smell I've ever smelled. To this day, I wish I can't wait to smell it again. The sky was breathtakingly blue. The grass was just a little bit damp from the morning dew and green. Like if you've ever been to Ireland and they talk about the green shades there, it was not, I've been there and it was nothing like I've ever seen. And whoever I was with, I was very comfortable to be there. There was, it was like, we were the only two that existed. No one else from my life existed at that point. And we were communicating and we were talking. And I was told that I was going back. I wasn't staying at this time. And we started walking and we're walking down this grassy knoll. And then I was shown a couple of things. Um, One of the things that I was shown was that my husband would be sick and it would be his time. I wasn't told that's why I'm going back to take care of him. I don't know if that, if I was or not, but there's a a, a few other things that I remember that I was told, but there's other things that I know were communicated to me and I can't remember, but I think it's just because it's not my time to remember. Yeah. Julie, did that give you comfort? when you lost Absolutely. your husband? And it, it did because he and I talked about this mm-hmm. because six weeks later after my surgery and I was home and I was very lucky. Um, I know how lucky I was. Um, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And so I was able to care for him and he, they gave him four to five months he wound up doing experimental treatments and it was a little over a year. Um, but his fear was at that point of not passing, but passing alone in a hospital room yeah. because I had, I was there and my treatments were completed. I was able to care for him. So I was able to give him hospice at home. So he started telling me when he, when he came to understand and accept that his time was very short, he st- we started talking and I told him about my experience and about four to five days before he passed, he would tell me about friends and loved ones and relatives that had passed and had come to him. To visit. Oh, and yeah. one of his best friends had passed and um, he also always called him bro. And I remember coming downstairs one morning And he said to me, he said, I saw Joe last night. And I said, you did? And he said, yeah. Joe said to me, hey, bro, it's not long. We're waiting for you. And my husband passed two days after that. So people did come. And it gave him great comfort knowing this. Yeah, that's powerful, Julie. And and the detail that you described, like with the grass and the dew, it was, it was so incredibly emotional for me because there is a sense of the detail, the power, the beauty of it all that is beyond, I felt, anything here. And as I said to Scott earlier, it, it doesn't change. It is so powerful. It's so crystal clear to me. And I carry it there. And, you know, to talk about back from the light. So after this all happened to me, I started going to these meetings with the IANS group, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And that in itself was remarkable because I was looking up information on on people to talk with where I could learn more about what had happened to me. 
and this IAMS thing comes up and I and I said that they were in Phoenix the, the year before and that they have an annual convention. So I called them up and I said, by the way, when when is your next convention? I said, maybe I could fly there and join you. And when is it? Well, get this. I live outside of Washington, D.C. in Maryland. It was in Alexandria, Virginia, which is 45 minutes from me. I said, well, when, when is it? They said, it starts Wednesday. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. Like, oh, so, like, hello, am I meant to go? And, and it was expensive, I will say, to go to the whole conference. But I could afford this a workshop of some sort. And I went to this workshop, which happened to be about After Effects. And a woman named Yvonne Sneeden, who is a co-producer of Back from the Light with me, we started talking after this fabulous workshop, which I found, you know, the, the information about people who trying to survive. And I was so new trying to figure this out. And we talked about the after effects and there were other people who had written books and talked about it. But it was a very unique, as you all said in the beginning, a very unique aspect of all of this. And um, she knew I was a filmmaker and we started talking and she said, I, I, let's talk about making a documentary together. And it was, we had to raise some money and they put in and, and Dr. Mary Neal, who was to heaven and back bestseller. She was one of our sponsors with that. Um, and um, it was just a wonderful um, support for it. And we, we traveled almost a year interviewing a number of survivors. Um, not again, so much about the near death experience. It's the elephant in the room, so to speak. We have to mention it but really more about how how people survive it's it's there's a almost like the near death experience has several commonalities so do the after effects as far as people how do you talk to your family you, you, you end up sounding a little crazy sometimes as some of the people actually say um why am i still here what am i supposed to do with this um you know um missing missing being in the light and that connection to it uh, all sorts of things like that and, and that seemed very important because I will be honest, a lot of people say, well, maybe it's just the last gasps of a dying brain. And it may be. I'm who am I to say? You know, I didn't go all the way, as I've said. I, I it was the but I know that whatever happens, the process of getting there is that easy. It's that beautiful. So if we are lulled into it and this is just the brain doing this here and now, I can still say it it when the time comes, it is easy, it is beautiful, it is profound. I don't believe that because of all the other things that come around it. I think there is a lot more to it, right. but even at the very least, that is it. But um, it, it is comforting in, in that way. But to 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 live with it afterwards, there are a lot of questions and people might say, we don't know whether that's real or not, but you can't say that I'm not depressed afterwards. That's real. That's here and now. People are, are 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 skeptical, or they question you, or you you don't know what am I supposed to do with my life and figure it out. That's very real. It's here and now. No one can say no, no. You're you're not feeling depressed. Yes, that is real. And and those are the elements I think the film addressed that I felt was important that I'm still struggling with. And yeah. I don't know you might as well. You know anyone who's been through it. I'm and that's what was remarkable remarkable about the film when I watched it was that it wasn't so much about the near death experience. Yeah. It was. Yes. what's happening after and it's not just what's happening to you what are the family members now i've never had an nde but if i had a family member who did and they kept talking about i just want to go back mm -hmm. uh how do you handle that as as yeah. a survivor as a spouse as a child as as someone who loves someone that you're so grateful that they're back in this world and they're talking about yeah but i don't want to be here <laughs> uh that's that that's frightening and we, we were a little obsessed with it, too. I mean, I know that I drive people crazy. My other half, too, because it, you always want to share the story. You always want to you're always it's part of you. It is an indelible part of you. And 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 it comes up. But I also have noticed, in, at least in my journey and and Julie, I'm, I'm maybe for you as well. And certainly by, by what you guys are doing, that there's certain clues that someone gives you sometimes when they mention something. And I, I don't always talk about it, but there's some things someone might say or a feeling. Mention it, Bob. And when I do, it turns out that person absolutely needed to hear it and they needed to share that and they needed that information. And it has led to some amazingly beautiful spiritual connections um, at times. And, and that's that's part of the journey. Part of the purpose is, I think, to give back and to share part of it. It's not an accident that we've been through this just, you know, for the fun of it. it it's There's a, a greater purpose. There, yeah, there is a purpose. I mean, I was, you know, always someone who was, you know, lighthearted, looked at the the bright side of things, um, mm -hmm. the eternal optimist. And um, 
after the experience, I'm still the eternal optimist um, because been there, done that. Okay. What's next? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not making light of it because it was really. No, it, but, it, but you do, but we can, we can, yeah. because we have been there, been there, done that, you know? Right. Um, my daughter, on the other hand, she was 16 at the time. Um, and it was really terrifying for her. And actually you being on the show, we had a conversation about this just mm. about a week ago. And she had said she never wanted to hear the full story of what happened and what I saw on the other side. And so now she's 33 and she's actually a mental, she's a licensed mental health, mental health worker. Mm. Um, and she said, mom, you need to understand. She said, I didn't know it at the time. Now I do that. It was a trauma for me yeah. because you, she said, she had, she said, I don't want to sound callous about this, but she said, you were the one that was supposed to die but you lived and dad died. Yeah. So she said, the whole thing was a trauma for me for that entire year, um, which, you know, being a mental health worker, she's in counseling for it even now. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't that traumatic. For me, right. I, I've always been kind of a spiritual person from day one, from whenever I can remember. So I sort of knew this place existed, call it heaven, call it whatever you want to, you know, Summerland, whatever you want to call it. I always in my mind knew this place existed. Um, so for me, it wasn't as traumatic as maybe someone else. Yeah. And it was easy for me to accept this. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I've started recently with a therapist. I will admit it to the world because um, actually 10 years later, and I've heard other people talk about this, I am beginning to deal with the trauma. Like it was still traumatic to have your heart stop and to be dead in an ambulance for a minute and a half and have them bring you back and that you almost didn't come back for whatever reason, right. you know, and, and it, it's sort of like that was the hidden part because people always say to me when they hear the story, oh, you must have been so frightened. It must have been such a terror. And I'm like, no, it was like a really wonderful experience in a way. And they're, they're horrified when you say that. And I said, no, I mean, but but now that time has gone on, there are elements that I, I'm admitting. Yes, there are elements of it that were traumatic in hindsight. Yes. But it still wasn't a frightening. Yes, it was the most beautiful experience I think I've ever been through. And there's no fear of death. And Scott asked me, he said, well, do you, do you, do you feel like you want to die again? Or I said, no, because I feel I have a purpose. I have things I need to do here. I was sent back like you, the things you need to do. And I ain't going anywhere until I'm done. But when, when my work is done, I get to go home, you know, I've and I don't mean home in a Christian or anything. I just mean home in that, that yeah. is, yeah. that is where we're from. That's where yeah. we go to. We come back from, I mean, all of that is what I believe. That's it. My, I've always thought that life is a gift. Yeah. Where it comes from, it's your belief where it comes from. Yeah. But I feel as though I was gifted twice. Yeah. You know? right. that, that's it. So I, my goal is to live every day, yes. get up every morning, live every day to the absolute fullest. I've always done this um, yeah. ever since I can remember. But now it's just more, more ingrained in me to try yeah. to tell other people to, you know, so yes. You know, and, and embrace the clouds. Go out there. Get out there. Exactly. Do <laughs> yes. it. Go for it. Because what's meant to be is going to happen. Exactly. And if I'm gonna, if I'm meant to live past that, I'm going to. And if I'm not, I won't. And right. it's okay either way. But embrace the day. Yes. Embrace your life. Embrace the people you love. Go out. Feel the sunshine on your face. Embrace the breeze. I mean, just love. Appreciate the beauty. Mm -hmm. There's so much that people freak out about, and I'm like, you know, my God, you know. I said, and I joke, I'm, and I'm a reverend, because like I said, we've earned the right. I said, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to you? Been there, done that. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Robert, you know, I would love, we have like a trailer of your film that you no. did. And I would love to share this you know, sure. trailer, if that's okay. That way people, if they want to take a look at it and rent it or buy it or whatever, they can do that. It's on Vimeo. Thing. I mean, that's that's where I have hard copy DVDs that we can mail, but um, we printed a whole bunch of them, but nobody watches DVDs anymore. It's all digital. So you'd say it's on Vimeo. It right can, on Vimeo and it was yeah. easy to watch. And and so uh, if it's okay with you, I'd love to show this. I think people Please. would really appreciate it. It's that. short. It's a short. All right, let's do it. Forty-six, seventy, forty-six, come in. 
During the near-death experience, that purity of nirvana, that perfect love, that wholeness, when you're separated from that and you come back into the physical body, you miss it so much. You don't want to be back here. You no longer fear death, quite the opposite. You want to die because you want to be back there and experience that again. I didn't want to return to Earth, and I didn't want to return to my life. I had a wonderful husband. I had four young children that I loved dearly. And I felt a little guilty that if I'd had the choice, I would have left again. Death doesn't scare me. It's something when you go to the other side and you come back, you're like, well, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of actually not living. I tried to talk to family and friends, and, and they just bad reactions. They had bad reactions because they, they didn't understand it. I think it probably frightened them. One of the things that I, I felt very strongly about it was not entering into a debate about near-death experiences. The experience is the experience, but really what matters is the after effects. Just the fact that you were gone and left this world briefly, though it might be, is mind shattering. You are so convinced that what you've seen on the other side is so real it may not line up with what the church believes in. If you don't stop talking insane like this, I'm going to have you put away. And he explained what that meant. We are so excited for, uh, about what happened to us that we want to tell the world. It's not the fact to have any of this experience. It's to survive it. It's to make sense. Why this happened to me? What am I supposed to do with this? First of all, you have to worry, is your husband or wife or your mate going crazy? Once you realize they're not crazy, then you have this other struggle. If they're not crazy, my worldview has to change. I haven't watched that in a while. That, thank you for sharing. Very that. powerful. It Very really, powerful. and the whole film is powerful. I mean, it was just... Uh, yeah. and I've got goosebumps right now. I can't <laughs> see them, but I have goosebumps because it's emotional. It's, but it's not about the it's not about the other side. No, about, it's about here. It's about here. coming back it's and how to here. deal with it. It's 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 something that I think is there to help people really. And and if it's selfish, it's to help near death survivors. But it's not really. It's to help family members too. It's to help friends and family members to understand this is what. It is, and it goes into quite length, and we've got some fascinating people. People who are researchers, people have written books, uh, people who have um, really devoted a lot of time and effort to to exploring, you know, how to help people here and now. So, these folks that that you documented in your film were they people you knew, or people you met through the society, or? Uh, a little bit of both. Some were friends that I knew and others were people that uh, through IONS that um, Yvonne Sneeden, my, my, my co-producer and, and partner on this, that we knew um, that um, we brought in and asked if you would be able to do that. There was other research um, uh, of people that we found and, and made inquiries and some people said, yes, we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, it's fascinating because there's a wide variety of life lifestyles and uh and backgrounds and and this common element is is really profound but a lot of it was through yvonne and the ions group and i'm very appreciative for that access um to to that information and and this was almost 10 years ago now that we made this it'll be 10 years ago this august since i've had my you can see i was i was a little younger then a little, a little I was thinking you looked exactly the same oh you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I, it's something because we have a little more time left, but I, I wanted to touch on something that you and I have spoken about. And mm -hmm. we've, uh, you know, we've been working on some things together and chatting about different things. Yeah. Since this experience, you have some heightened psychic awareness, psychic, I, I, you know, psychic ability sounds woo, -woo but <laughs> there have been things that have, that have, that have happened to you. Um, and it's, I don't think, you may have, I, I think we talked about this and correct me if I'm wrong. This may be something that you've had even beforehand. Yeah. Since this, it has been very different. How, how has this changed? Well, well to encapsulate it, um, 
I think to to connect with the other side, so to speak, or with whatever happens, I think something gets gets kickstarted inside us. And other people talk about that in the documentary too. I think there are heightened awareness, heightened sensitivity. Something changes you is the only way I I I feel about it. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so a short version of a longer story is that this is been something that kickstarted for me many, many years ago, which was very odd in the way that that happened, that when I was 16, 17, I always felt like maybe I was a seagull in another life or something. I always had dreams of flying and things like that. And I know a lot of people do. And at one point I would sit down at a, a typewriter back then and I would just do automatic writing or I just write. I just, whatever flowed into my head. Sometimes I wouldn't even know what I wrote until I was done writing it. And at one point I wrote a story about a man in France in, in the 1700s, long story who's arrested and then eventually is taken to a, a busy, dirty town square with hundreds of people and beheaded on a guillotine, you know? It was like a scene out of uh, A Tale of Two Cities, but it was very vivid and, and and dirtier. And, you know, and there was something about the movie that just coursed through me when I actually saw it as, as, a, as a younger person. And um, as I'm writing this story about this story, I chose to write what happens after the blade fell and the person died. It was my own, per I didn't even know what I wrote. And like I said, this was this was in, in 70, 1977, I believe, somewhere in there. And um, we had uh, some gentlemen from the Renaissance community. It's no longer here, but they were based in Massachusetts. It was a commune that believed in reincarnation, and they had a very spiritual outlook. And um, my father was, was an attorney in the entertainment industry, and these guys had a, a rock choir, and they rented rock buses, touring buses to companies. They did construction as well. So they were helping do some construction in our house, and I knew these guys were into reincarnation. So here I write this crazy story about you know a guy who dies on a guillotine back in 17 something with my own personal view of what it was like to die. Um, and at the time there was music, there was a darkness, there was light, there was floating, there was all of this stuff, which is now very, very common. At the time, it was not common knowledge at all. So I showed these guys and they're reading my story. They're going, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. and I'm like, what, what, what did I write? Because I thought they, you know, they might find it interesting. They said, Bob, I want you to get this book called, um, um, I've gone blank on the name, Life After Life by Dr. Raymond Moody. It was brand new. It had been out maybe a year. I'd never heard of it. And these, this was a book, as some of you may know, 125 subjects here and now who had died, clinically been resuscitated, and they all had these common elements of which were unique. No one had thought of it before. I certainly hadn't. And I thought, how do I know? How could I write a story about what it's like to die when I've never died? I've never had a near-death experience, yet I'm writing what all these people clinically here and now actually were describing. It blew my mind. Is there something here? It was that moment after that happened that I started having very vivid um, psychic things like uh, uh, plane accidents and, and connections to things. Um, literally, once I was sitting in a... in, in um, my mother's bedroom watching a salute to Israel on television and I blanked out of the room. I'm floating over water and a 727 jet flies right over me, crashes into the water, a plume of water comes up and the plane's just bobbing there. I snapped out of it. My mother's like, are you all right? I said, you won't believe this. I saw this plane crash in, in front of me, right over water. And there was like a, 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 co a coastline in the distance with these little lights. And uh, she said, well, you, you have a very vivid imagination. Long story. The news came on at 11. Of course, there's nothing about a plane crash. 15 minutes in, this report, a National Airlines 727 has just crashed into Pensacola Bay. No reports yet on survivors. My mother looked at me like I grew a second head. I burst into tears. It was happening as it was. And I remember it all because Barbara Streisand was talking to Gold in my ear. And I looked it up, the NTSB report. This is real. It did happen exactly as I remembered it. And that was only one of many, but that was so vivid not long afterwards. So something kicked in by even remembering or fantasizing or whatever you want to call it back then. So yeah, it's, something it's very interesting because as a yeah. child, I've always had uh, been a psychic empath. I knew this mm -hmm. and I had several instances of precognition. Mm. 
where it was so vivid. I knew exactly what was going to happen that day. And it wasn't anything like a plane crash or anything else. Right. It was just something unusual happening that day or the next day that was not in line with normal life right. that would happen. Um, so that's really interesting that you had that yeah. and I've had that. Um, and yeah. we share near death experiences. Is there a reason or purpose yeah. behind it? Yeah, there might be. You know, and, and you know, Robert, I was just going to say this because we only have two minutes left. Oh, wow. But I do want to just, I know it's like, the, it's always like the fastest <laughs> hour. I would love to have you back sometime later in the year or next year. To uh, I'd be honored. What comes after this? Because I know that this, you know, you came back for a reason, right? And all of this other stuff is happening. But I want to make sure in the last two minutes that people know how to get your video. So if we're going to, and we can put it in the little, the comments underneath, but if they want to go to Vimeo, Vimeo.com, right. how yeah. would they search for that? Back search for the, the title, light. Back From The Light, not, you know, Back From yeah. The Light. You can put yeah. my name in, Robert Neil Marshall. If you yeah. Google Back From The Light or Robert Neil Marshall, you, you will find it. There's the trailers there for free. You can watch it. I think it's $2 and change to rent it. Or $4.99. You can, $4.99. $4.99 rent it. Okay. Or yeah. you could buy it. Yep. Yeah, and we're not making, I mean, believe me, there's no real profit here. This is just, it, it, it's there for people to share um, if they if they want to experience that. It's less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And to be honest with you, you know, I'd rather make my own coffee and watch your movie. So there it is, because it really is that good. If you get a chance to watch, it really, truly is that good. It and is, then, absolutely, yes. And then hopefully, you know, sometime next year, maybe we can pick this up where we left off because I could have gone another hour with you and sometimes this happens. I would love we to, just, guys. We just love to chat. And Absolutely. I know Julie and you have a lot in common. And I, Julie, I know. I want to talk with you more, Julie. Oh. Off, offline, please, let's connect. I mean, that's Absolutely. Beautiful. And if you're ever in Boston, we need to meet for coffee. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll fly up there. I'm married to a flight attendant. I just have to take the time oh. to get on a plane. Oh, there we go. I'm just outside of Boston. There you, <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. So we definitely will pick this up. And Robert, if you stay on the show for one minute after we close, after the closing credits, we'll chat for just a minute. But I'd love sure. to have you come back, chat Thank about you. what's happening to you. And, you know, of course, you do have all these other projects that you're working on, too, which are also very exciting. And I love chatting with you. You it's too. Nice to say, I have a friend. You've seen him on TV, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you make me sound more famous than I actually am. I'm just a working stiff in the business and That's grateful it. for what anyway. the opportunities are. So thank you for being here, Robert. Thank you, Julie. We'll see you all next week on the Paranormal you, Project. It's been a real Bye, pleasure. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. You have been listening to The Paranormal Project with Scott Allen and Julie Finn. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. While you're there, leave us a rating and review so others can find out about the show. Stay haunted and go out there and explore the paranormal. <laughs>